Today we're going to look at, well, what I would like to call my method for doing epsilon delta proofs, but I think it's a pretty universally taught method. And this is something that you generally see at the beginning of a real analysis class. And it's most definitely not the hardest thing that you do in real analysis, but a lot of students really can't get past this and thus they're overwhelmed for the rest of the course. But if you master this, then you're in good shape to be able to focus on the harder stuff that comes later in the class. Okay, so let's see what we have. I've got an outline over here, and then I've got an outline of scratch work over here. This is an outline of a proof, I should say. So let's see this outline. Our claim is that the limit as x goes to a of f of x is equal to l. And everything that's written is in white is something that would be, well, in any writing of a proof like this. So it's useful to start off with this phrase, given epsilon bigger than zero, and then you want to take delta equal to something that depends on epsilon. And for all of the examples we're going to do today, and for almost all of the examples that you'll see in a real analysis class, it'll be epsilon over a number. Or maybe it's the minimum of something and epsilon over a number, which we'll see in several of our examples. And we'll talk about where this number comes from. And then you'll observe that if the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, we have, okay, well, let's look at these two things that I have written here. So I've got this brown box, and I've put this in brown because this does not occur in every proof. It only occurs in maybe the second level of these proofs. You know, a little bit more difficult than the base level. Well, so let's look in there. So if x minus a is less than delta, then I have this line right here where x is between a minus 1 and a plus 1. But shouldn't it be a minus delta and a plus delta? Well, perhaps. But that being said, this is one of those special cases where you do this wishful thinking step of setting delta equal to 1, which we'll get to. Okay, so now you'll manipulate this inequality, which is built off of this inequality that we're assuming, into an inequality which has this extra term less than some number. And that number is exactly the number that you put over here. And then from there, what follows is simply a calculation. You start over here with absolute value of f of x minus l, and you manipulate that until it looks like an extra term, well, the same extra term here, times x minus a. But by our setup, that's going to be less than a number times delta. But then by the way that we defined delta, that's going to be less than or equal to epsilon. Okay, so now let's look at the outline of the scratch work, which is really kind of doing this kind of stuff or engineering this in reverse. So you're going to manipulate the object absolute value of f of x minus l less than epsilon into the form x minus a times some extra term is less than epsilon. And then we, we've got two cases, and those two cases break down into, do we need this brown box or not? So the first case is, if that extra term is just equal to a number, then we're totally done. And that number goes right here into this epsilon over a number. Otherwise, if the extra term is not equal to a number, but it depends on x, then you're going to set delta equal to zero. That's like your test delta. And then observe that if x minus a is less than 1, then a minus 1 is less than x, which is less than a plus 1. And then you'll manipulate this until you have some extra term. Well, this extra term right here is less than that number or some number. And that's recalling that this extra term is going to depend on x in this case. So you just manipulate x until it's that extra term. Okay, so now that we've got this out in all of these generalities, let's work through several examples.
So our first example is pretty straightforward. We want to show that the limit as x goes to 4 of 3x minus 7 equals 5. So let's go over here to our scratch work. So like I said before, we're going to manipulate this absolute value of, well, if it's f of x minus l less than epsilon in 2, well, that absolute value of x minus a times an extra term less than epsilon. But in this setup, we have the absolute value of 3x minus 7 minus 5, and then we want to manipulate that until it, ha it has an x minus 4 in it. Okay, so let's do that. And here we're just going to do some rough calculations. So notice that the absolute value of 3x minus 7 minus 5 being less than epsilon is equivalent to saying that the absolute value of 3x minus 12 is less than epsilon. But now that's going to be equivalent to the absolute value of x minus 4 times 3, I'll bring the 3 out front, is less than epsilon. Oh, but notice that this is playing the role of our extra term, this number three right here. So we have extra term in this case is equal to the number three, which, which is a number. So let's recall that in that setup, we would set delta equal to epsilon over that number. And let's see why that works. Well, if delta is less than epsilon over 3, then if this is less than delta, when we multiply the 3s, they cancel, and we have our whole thing is less than epsilon. And then furthermore, since this extra term is already equal to a number, we don't need this middle part right here. All we have to do is fill in some of the missing things, like I need a 4 here, and then I need our final calculation here, which is essentially this in reverse. Okay, so let's get at that. So we've got our absolute value of 3x minus 7 minus 5. So like we wrote before, that's the same as the absolute value of 3x minus 12, which in turn is 3 times the absolute value of x minus 4. But now we're kind of home free. So that's going to be less than 3 times delta, but delta is equal to epsilon over 3. So that's equal to 3 times epsilon over 3, which is equal to epsilon. And let's observe that that makes it all work, because we've shown if the absolute value of x minus 4 is less than delta, then the absolute value of, well, this is our f of x minus l is less than epsilon. But that's exactly what we need for the limit definition of, or the precise definition of the limit. Okay, so let's do another. Okay, so for our next one, we'll show that the limit as x goes to 2 of x squared equals 4. And this is going to be a bit trickier, but it starts off the same. We want to manipulate absolute value of x squared minus 4 less than epsilon into x minus 2 times some extra term is less than epsilon. And why x minus 2? Well, because our limit is approaching 2. Okay, so let's do that. So we've got x squared minus 4 in absolute values less than epsilon. That's equivalent to, well, I think this thing is just screaming for us to factor it by using a difference of squares. So that's equivalent to x minus 2 times x plus plus 2 is less than epsilon. Oh, but now our extra term, which I'll put a pink box around, has to do with x. So that means we need to bound that. And that means that we use the second case of our like if else statement. So in other words, we need to bound this x plus 2, so we're going to use our what if delta was equal to 1 setup. Okay, so if delta is equal to 1, that means if x minus 2 is less than 1, then we in fact have x between 1 and 3. But now adding 2 to all parts of this, we'll see that x plus 2 is between 3 and 5. But notice that 3 and 5 are both positive, so that means that the absolute value of x plus 2 is between 3 and 5, but we just need to bound it above. So that means the absolute value of x plus 2 is less than 5. 
And so there, we've got our extra term, which I put this pink box around, is bound above by this number that we spoke about before. So that number was a part of our original proof and it'll be a part of all of our proofs. Okay, so now let's recall that the general way to do this is to set delta equal to epsilon over whatever number that's bounding this extra term. But here we made this assumption, or we did this what if statement of delta being equal to one. So that means in fact, delta is not equal to epsilon over five in this case, it's the minimum of those two. Okay, so let's make sure to encode that here. We'll have the minimum of one and epsilon over five. And now let's see where that takes us. So observe that if the absolute value of x minus two is less than delta, we have, well, we're going to have x between one and three. And so that follows because delta is less than or equal to one. And thus, it leads us to see that the absolute value of x plus two is less than five. So this is all the calculation that I believe needs to go in here, but if you wanna put a couple of more details based around this blue box that's, or that brown box, that's totally fine. And now we're ready to our, for our final calculation. So let's maybe put an and here, and notice that here we've got absolute value of x squared minus four is equal to absolute value of x minus two times absolute value of x plus two. By our choice of delta, we know that the absolute value of x plus two is less than five, so that's less than five times delta. So this x minus two is less than delta, and then this x plus two is less than five. But now that's gonna be less than or equal to five times epsilon over five, which is equal to epsilon. So this is a less than or equal to because we're replacing delta with epsilon over five. And delta is gonna be less than or equal to each of those just based off of the fact that we set it equal to the minimum. But now we've done exactly what we wanted to. If x minus two was less than delta, then absolute value of x squared minus four is less than epsilon, meaning we finished this proof using the precise definition of the limit. Okay, let's look at another. So for our next example, we'll show that the limit as x goes to negative three of one over x is negative one third. And we're using the same outline, which means our first step is to manipulate this inequality until we get something that looks like x minus negative three in there times some extra term. Okay, so let's see if we can do that. So let's start here with one over x plus one third less than epsilon. I'll just like cancel the minus signs. But now let's note that that's equivalent to x plus three over three x in absolute values less than epsilon. That's just by finding a common denominator. But in turn, that's equivalent to the absolute value of x plus three times one over the absolute value of three x is less than epsilon. Showing us that in this case, the extra term depends on x again, and it's this one over absolute value of three x. Which means we have to do this brown box step that we had to do in the last proof as well. Okay, so let's set delta equal to one, and notice if x minus negative three is less than one, then what does that tell us about x? So where does x lie? So that means that x lies between negative four and negative two. So that follows pretty quickly just by taking that absolute value inequality into a compound inequality. But now we can take an absolute value there and we'll see that means that two is less than the absolute value of x, which is less than four. So if x is negative, then the absolute value is going to, you know, kind of swap the upper endpoints of that. Or sorry, swap the ends of the absolute value. But now we can multiply by three and we'll get six is less than the absolute value of three x, which in turn is less than 12. 
and now we can take the reciprocal and we'll, we'll have to swap the inequalities again. We get 1 12th is less than 1 over absolute value 3x, which in turn is less than 1 6th. Oh, so now that's our number. So we set, we, well, we got to the point where our extra term was less than some number. And recall that we always want to set our delta equal to epsilon over, well, whatever that number we ended up with. Or the minimum of one of that if we had to do this extra step, which we did in this case. Okay, so now we're ready to go. So let's set delta equal to the minimum of one and epsilon over one over six, which is the same thing as six epsilon. And then observe that if the absolute value of x minus negative three is less than delta, we have, well, we have, let's see, x is between what and what? So negative four um, and negative two. And so again, that follows from this kind of calculation. Again, I feel like you don't have to put any of that in there. I think it, it sort of is obvious, but you can put a couple of steps if you want to. Um, and then th from this, it follows that one over 12 is less than one over the absolute value of three X, which is in turn then a less than one over six. And then we're ready to do our final calculation. So let's do that. So this is gonna be equal to the absolute value of one over X plus one over three, which in turn is equal to the absolute value of X plus three times one over the absolute value of three X, just by straightforward calculation. But now that is less than the absolute value of X plus three times one over six, which is equal to, which is less than delta over six, which is less than or equal to epsilon by our choice of delta up here. Okay, so there we did it. Okay, so I hope this outline approach maybe relieves some of the stress of writing these epsilon delta proofs of limits. And that's a good place to stop.